and thank you for that kind introduction, um, Gabriella. And welcome all of you to the presentation. I attend a formal presentation, so if at any time you have questions, just post them in the chat, and Gabriella will be accumulating the questions, and then at the end, we'll have a lot of time for today. Um, I don't know that I'll be taking the full hour from presentation, so that'll give us additional time for discussion, which I think is really valuable. Um, okay, so, and then the, also on the, in the, uh, the beginning, I want to also acknowledge that one of my partners and colleagues, um, Louise Raymond, is also on the call, and she might be chiming in with comments here and there um, where she, where, um, during the course of my presentation. So, um, just to set the context, we're talking about simplifying sustainability while building capacity in supply chains. Um, I'm really focusing on, on building the capacity within the companies that supply, that are in the, within the supply chain, and we'll talk more about that. So, just last month, or just in July, um, Peter Bacher, who is who leads the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, was talking about how we define sustainability, how it's really become too complex. And having worked in sustainability since the mid-90s, which is quite some time now, um, I can say that I, I agree, you know, that it's uh, all of the complexity that we've added has it's kind of gotten us to this point, and that's a lot of what I'll talk about, but we now really have this need to simplify sustainability so that we can manage it um, more effectively. Um, this is from an article that I was just reading a couple of days ago from McKinsey and really talking about how, and this is how most large companies that have very little visibility into their suppliers, there's a supply chain, um, really even beyond just the tier one suppliers, but that there's a lot of really, really um, um, unknown in, within the supply chain, but yet these companies are held accountable for that. So that, I'm segueing then from that into this presentation that I'm gonna initially um, start with setting the land talking about the paper supply chain responsibility, and then talking about the complexity of this whole field of standard certifications, industry initiatives, how it's practiced today, and where I think that's headed, where I think the opportunity is, and then what we're doing at Teal. So that's what we'll, the journey that we'll be on together over the next 45 minutes to an hour. Okay, so setting the landscape. Um, I'm, I'm starting by setting the global landscape, right? The, the, the macro level landscape of all of these things that we know are touching our lives on a day-to-day -day basis now. Things like um, the, all of the you know, systemic changes and issues that we're finding in climate change um, due to climate change, ocean plastics, the circular economy, and the need to really rethink the way that we develop and package and the whole value chain of products and, and all that we're doing and really looking at things in a much more circular way. Um, I might mention that, in my opinion, William McDonough is kind of the founder of, in my opinion, of the circular economy movement when he really wrote, you know, decades ago now about food, food, waste equals food and how we really need to rethink waste and how, you know, waste really equals food. Um, and then DNI. and this country of lives matter and really the importance of just you know having diversity and inclusion in all that we do so i just wanted to just this is just a highlight of the many thousands of articles that are mentioning sustainability in the news these days um, and all of the pieces of the puzzle that it that it touches but I just really just want to paint this picture that, you know, as opposed to when I started working in this field decades ago, this is really um, a headline, headline news these days and therefore a business imperative. Um, and on that same vein, we now have the UN Sustainable Development Goals 
Um, and that's because it is a global concern. Sustainability is a global concern. And the UN SDGs have just been one framework through which um, of many actually that but a global framework that is allowing us to look at um, sustainability in a global way and for everyone to have a framework through which to assess their own their own footprint um, and many many companies are using the SDGs now um, in, in addition to other frameworks that we'll talk about um, to look at their own footprint um, I wanted to mention that the SDGs, the SDGs um, many of the different sustainable development goals that you see here on the screen are touched by supply chain responsibility. Um, so there's not one particular SDG that addresses supply chain. It, it, many of the different pieces of this puzzle um, that you see on the screen are touch supply chain. So I wanted to then talk about what is supply chain responsibility? How do we define that? So the way we define it is this holistic responsibility for all aspects of your supply chain, including you know the triple Hello. bottom line, but also um, I always look at a culture. Hello, Hello? Uh, this is Gabriella. We're experiencing a poor audio quality. Um, I, I wonder if it's possible for you to dial in. A lot of attendees are having uh, technical difficulties in hearing you. Would it be possible for you to dial in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, to, to, uh, what number should I call? So you're here. there's a way for you to go onto, <clears throat> if you click audio settings, under like little upward arrow near the mute button, you can click switch to phone audio and that will make it so that you can dial in and it'll, it'll give you instructions on see. how to. Upward arrow. Okay. To all of our attendees, I'm sorry. I apologize for this little technical difficulties. We'll be uh, fixing that in a short moment. Bear with us patiently, please. Would you like for me to start over? No, I believe you can take it from there. I count. Paula, can you hear us? You have not entered any numbers. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Hear you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Great. I apologize, everyone, for that. Um, I hope you didn't miss too much. Uh, do you, are you sure you don't want me to start over? I think We're we good. can take it from here. Uh, but I okay. appreciate you, Paula. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I apologize for that. Okay, so let me, I'll just start over here with what I was saying about. Um, that, okay, that um, I was just talking about the sustainable development goals and how the sustainable development goals are, um, have been put out by the United Nations. And that is one, and, you know, one framework through which we, many companies are using to look at their, their sustainability footprint and to assess where they are from a sustainability perspective. 
and it's um, it's one of many different frameworks that companies can use. Um, and the, one of the points that I wanted to to make here is that um, supply chain is not an independent goal of the SDGs. It's incorporated into many of these different goals. And so, your supply the supply chain responsibility footprint. Um, many of these different goals touch on supply chain. Okay, and so then I wanted to just talk uh, about supply chain responsibility. So what is what does that mean? Um, how do we define it? So the way we define it um, is looking, um, extending holistic responsibility for all aspects of your supply chain, including the triple bottom line of environmental, social, and economic, and then also a cultural component, so responsibility to the cultures within which you operate. Um, and it encompasses all that you make and how it's made and how it's transported. Um, and I also wanted to point out here that there's a lot of confusion around the different terms that are used. Um, there's a term, um, ESG, which refers to environmental, social, and governance that is used interchangeably a lot with the term for sustainability. Um, and ESG is used a lot more in the financial sector and in the capital markets. Um, but really ESG and sustainability are referring to the same thing. And on that same note, there are many different um, ter terminologies or terms that are used to refer to supply chain responsibility. Um, and those are things like ethical trading, responsible sourcing, lots of different terms. And I just want to point out that this just adds to the complexity and the confusion that we're finding in our, in our space. But those terms all really refer to the same thing, in my opinion. So then I just wanted to set, again, the macro landscape of what's driving corporate accountability around supply chain responsibility. And it's a lot of these kind of real macro level systemic things that we've that have been that we've seen over the last 10, 20 years that have been evolving around the information age and shareholder activism. Shareholder activism is so much more um, they're much more empowered, engaged, and in taking action now because in the, because technology allows for that. Um, the immediacy of information from social media, the 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 viral communication. And um, the consumers demand, therefore, consumers really demand, demanding more transparency. Um, in addition to the glo globalization, you know, we're a much more connected world than we were even a couple of decades ago. Um, we're realizing that our, our resources are finite, right? And as a geologist, and my undergrad degree training is in geology, so I have a really heightened idea, sense or connection with the finite resources that we have on our planet. Um, and that's a really key part, in my opinion, to supply chain responsibility. Um, and then the complexity of it. You know, supply chains have become networks that supply web. Um, they're really, it's very, they're very, very complex. You know, it's not like it was, you know, um, a generation or so ago. Our supply chains these days have become very complicated. Um, so why why supply chain responsibility? Really, it, it's a lot, you'll hear me talk a lot about this throughout the presentation about risk and reputation management. Um, this increasing regulation in investor and capital market requirements. Um, there's retailer and brands are rapidly rolling out requirements of their suppliers as a license to do business, and I'll be expanding on this more um, as a, uh, throughout the presentation as well. And so, therefore, there's this, and this, this increased expectation of transparency of companies really being transparent about all that's going on and within their whole supply chain. So um, many of these companies are now trying to figure out systems and through which to to manage that to manage that expectation. So some of the trends that we're seeing, the industry trends, so within specific, within different industry sectors, you know, we're and in how industries are trying to address, you know, these demands from an industry perspective. We're seeing more industry collaboration within industries, right? And but we're also seeing more cross-industry collaboration as well. Um, 
One example that I can use for that is the, the cross-industry collaboration between the, the Responsible Jewelry Association and the jewelry industry and the automotive industry and others, the electronics industry, around uh, conflict minerals and learning from each other about conflict minerals and how to manage that. And then we have industry-specific initiatives and codes of conduct. Um, and I'll expand more on that. And then industry standards, you know, that are that are coming up that are industry industry specific um, tools like Ecovatus, FedEx, and the GSCP, and others for supplier data consolidation. Um, so we're seeing a lot of these sort of industry specific trends. So what is the business case for supply chain responsibility? A lot of what I'm going to be talking about over the next few minutes within the business case is also kind of the landscape as well. Um, they're they're, cro they're cross-pollination in many ways. So why supply chain responsibility now? And what are some of the drivers? So as I get, again, as I said, as I'll, and I'll say again, that I feel like the key driver for companies is managing their risk. And there's many different dimensions of that risk that they're managing. Um, there's, you know, the brand brand risk, there's market capitalization risk, there's environmental risk, you know, there's access to capital risk. There's a lot of different risks that they're that they're managing. In addition, um, there's the opportunity to reduce costs and to find efficiencies. And in addition to that, is, is increasing revenue. And so one of the main point, you know, the takeaway from this slide is about the business case. The business case is, you know, really the bottom, you know, the bottom line. Like, how is this going to affect the bottom line of a company? And these are three ways that it directly affects the, the bottom line of, of a business. In addition is regulation. So I just wanted to paint kind of this larger picture of the regulate, regulatory landscape. Um, you know, we're not seeing a lot of new regulation, obviously, in the United States right now, but we do have state, some state, local, you know, local and state-specific regulation. You know, one example I like to use is the California uh, SB 657 Supply Chain Act that, you know, requires companies to disclose their efforts to remove slavery and human trafficking from their supply chains. Um, we also have Dodd-Frank, um, which, um, um, it, it addresses conflict minerals, but um, as of 2017, the SEC is not enforcing that the way it was um, initially. In the European Union, obviously, we see there we see a lot of, of regulation, and some of the key regulation that I feel like is important for for this audience is our two at the um, the sustainability integration disclosure rules that are starting next year around. Um, Re 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 regulation around re ex um, disclosing really being very articulate and there's certain um, regulations and requirements around what you have to be able to prove if you're going to be branding your product sustainable. And I think that that's really key for this audience that if you're selling a product that you're calling sustainable and you're selling it in the EU, you have there are going to be certain disclosure requirements around that starting next year. Um, in addition, we have the EU non-financial reporting directive, which was rolled out a couple of years ago, which um, just requires uh, sustainability reporting of large corporations. Um, we, we, that, that is in place in many, many countries around the world. So in addition, there's what I call the perception gap. There's this gap in perception like the, of what consumers perceive that companies know about their supply chain and what internal internal the internal, internal corporate perception of what supply chain responsibility is. And so there's this real gap of, of the knowledge, you know, that a company actually has and what consumers perceive they have. And to me, that is the real key piece of the risk. So, um, in addition, I just wanted to, sh to show where the external stakeholder pressures are coming from. So they're coming from all these different stakeholder groups. It's not just coming from consumers or just from governments around the world. It's coming from activists and, 
industry peers and media and investors, investors increasingly. Um, and um, in fact, the investor pressure has inc increased really dramatically, in my opinion, over the last year to 18 months. So again, these consumer expectations are being pushed down the supply chain. Um, an opaque supply chain, which is one that you don't really have a lens into, is a significant rent risk. Um, it's increasing these expectations in the supply chain are increasing this need again for transparency. We have a real much more heightened expectation of companies and their accountability around sustainability and their accountability to things like climate change and circular economy and reducing their plastics use and packaging from um, the millennial and not only millennials, but Gen X, Y, and Z. Um, and they're growing in purchasing power. And so, I mean, just in my opinion, from the work that we do and for the, that, that that's great news actually, that there's a real increasing, per, you know, increasing demand from, from, from the generations that are coming up into purchasing power. Um, so, in addition, sustainability, it, it is complex and therefore there's, there's need to simplify it and it can be really expensive to, to implement. So, I just wanted to talk, to, to call out um, the importance of carbon management and supply chain responsibility um, because I feel like it's it's one of the biggest pieces of supply chain responsibility that's really um, has a real immediate need and a, there's opportunities. So there's not only the risk that we're that companies are seeing um, that are really affecting their supply chain. And some examples of that are like this the increase that we're seeing in fires and storms even today that are really disrupting business and and therefore disrupting their supply chains. Um, so it's a top priority to really look at look within your supply chain and how you can reduce your, your carbon footprint of your supply chain. You know, whether that's reassessing how it's transported or reassessing, you know, sourcing, trying to source more locally than globally. There's many different ways that that can be um, addressed, um, but that's a real key piece of the puzzle. So again, risk management, there's many different uh, dimensions of that. Um, uh, corporations are being held accountable not only for their own practices but for the practices of their suppliers and I, I, I don't know if I got this point across already but it's not just what's called the tier one supplier the first supplier in your supply chain but it's the, the, the footprint of the practices of um, all of the suppliers up and down the supply chain and very, very few companies have a lens into that entire supply chain. Um, so, um, and then, you know, I just, like it's quoted on the screen, any type of business can be implicated in human rights abuses, you know, they can be implicated and they might not even know that that's happening and they might not have a way to, you might not have a way, you know, to, to substantiate whether it's valid or not. So I think it's, it, again, it's billions of dollars are at stake for companies with strong brands. And I think, you know, most, um, if, there, if there are any big brand companies that are participating in the call today, I know this is not news to you, or it's not probably not new information, but we're all still trying to figure out the best way to, to manage it. So uh, customer demands, I just wanted to highlight this. I don't know if many of you know Cone, um, but Cone is a, um, they do great work and they have a survey that they do every year and um, they get, they really get the voice of the customer or the, or the consumer. And I've seen, I've been tracking the Cone survey over the course of the last 20 years or so. And I just want, I just am sharing this with you because I've seen these numbers these percent numbers increasing over the last 20 years or so that they've been doing this survey. Um, so like just the, the, you know, in 2017, the survey said 87% 87 of the general population would buy a product with a social or environmental benefit. I mean, that's a huge difference from where we were 10, 15 years ago. So now I just wanna talk about 
briefly about the supply chain standard certifications and initiatives. And I really want you to take a minute to look at this image on the screen because in my opinion, it, it very it really articulates, you know, where we are within the whole um, supply, the whole, what I call standard and certification fatigue. Um, so navigating the landscape is really confusing. I can't tell you how many times I've taught the companies that they really just need some direction on like which standards are, are important for them, which certifications are meaningful or material for them, um, which industry groups should they join. You know, there's just, it's all become very, very complex. And there's only one place that I know of that has a master database of all of these global standards and certifications, and it's um, an organ it's something called T4SD, if anyone doesn't know about that. Um, and it's out of Switzerland. Um, but they have a master database of all the global standards and certifications around sustainability. And I just wanted to go back and mention this uh, concept of the reality of standard and certification fatigue. And it's not just standards and certifications, it's surveys as well, that many companies are really struggling with this onslaught of, of, of surveys, which I'll talk more about in a minute. But um, there's a lot coming, a lot coming at you, you know, these days as a company and that you have to kind of navigate through. So I just wanted to show, this is just a sampling of different standards and initiatives, and I'm not going to talk in depth about any of them, but I just, the, the takeaway is just that there's so many different ones, and there's, there's labor standards, there's ag standards, there's initiatives and tools, you know, that are, that are being used around the world for managing different pieces of the puzzle. There's other, other related standards, there's ISO 14001 and 26000, and um, ASTM has their own standard, and ISO has recently come out with a supply chain responsibility standard. So there are many different standards and certifications that are out there. Um, I was just, um, and then to build upon that, there are many different standards that are just focused on the agricultural sector. This is just the sampling of them, right? There's many, many different ones. It's, everyone from the International Code of Conduct for the production of cut flowers to the Code of Conduct for the tea sector to responsible palm oil certification. Um, there's just a whole plethora of certifications and standards that are out there. In addition, industries are coming up with industry specific standards, and these are just a sampling of them. The carpet industry has one, sporting goods, the toy industry, the electronics industry. So I just want you to see that there's just this breadth and depth of complexity around all that has developed, which is great. You know, it's really, it's fantastic, you know, that we have all of these different frameworks now, but it also leads to a lot of confusion in the marketplace. So next, I'm just going to take a few minutes to talk about some of the cases of the work that we've done, just um, to show you how we've, we've approached some of our work. Um, we worked with Whole Foods over the course of about five years. Um, and looked at many different dimensions of supply chain responsibility for Whole Foods. Um, it was, a, as I said, a multi-year engagement. Um, we we looked at, we set up their whole supply chain responsibility program. Um, we aud set up an auditing function for their um, supply chain. We set up the supply chain responsibility management plan. The, we facilitated a meeting of their top 100 suppliers and then set up working groups of those top 100 suppliers. Um, we also did work within, um, with, within, the, within produce and within sustainable seafood and helped to um, advise on the creation of the, of the whole trade program. So I'm just sharing that with you because this is one company that you know, we it took many years to help kind of get the foundational work done um, to get the systems in place that are now in place. And that was years ago. They they they're now managing all, most of that internally. But um, there was a, it was a lot of work to get all of these different pieces of the puzzle set up. You know, initially. 
In addition, um, this other client, another client, we developed a sustainable supply chain strategy and plan. We helped to assess the risk, help them to look at how they engage with their suppliers, um, conducted a self-assessment. Um, we facilitated meetings with their stakeholders and then did a training of their suppliers and their staff. So now I want to talk about supply chain re responsibility and practice. So the road to here, like what, where, where we've come from, and then the road ahead. And again, supply chain responsibility is about managing risk. First and foremost, about managing risk. So how is that risk managed today? There are many different ways, many different um, modalities that have been developed for managing the supply chain risk. Um, these are just a sampling of them, and I'll talk about each one of these. Supplier codes of conduct. So most large global companies now have a supplier code of conduct, and that sets out the framework of what their expectations are from a sustainability perspective um, for their suppliers. And they then also, or most of them now, also require their suppliers to have their own supplier code of conduct. So, um, so it goes all the way up and down, you know, these, these tiers of the supply chain. In, a different, in, a, in, in addition, there's certification demands. There might be ISO compliance requirements. There might be other certifications that companies are asking of their suppliers. Um, there's not a lot of consistency around which certifications those would be. Um, then there's surveys. So let me talk for a minute about surveys because what I hear from companies more than anything is what I call the survey fatigue. Companies are being inundated with surveys from all different stakeholders in all different directions that are asking them about their sustainability performance. And most companies don't have a centralized way of managing those surveys. Um, and they don't have a centralized way of, most of them actually, quite frankly, are managing their data even today with Excel. Um, and they're trying to find more efficient ways to share information across the different functions within the company so that there's more consistent sharing of information and therefore it's easier to to report out to these surveys that they're getting inundated with. Um, the surveys come from all, all, like I said, all the different stakeholders. It could be they could be coming from their customers, so the companies that they sell to. It could be coming from um, the financial sector, from investors. They could be coming from activists. They come from lots of different places. And the increase in surveys has grown exponentially, in my opinion, over the last 10 years. In addition, there's social audits, or even environmental audits, but usually social audits. Um, but audits that look at, um, within your supply chain um, where things are actually being manufactured, and aud auditing the manufacturing that's going on within your supply chain. Those audits can be random audits, so that they, they're random, there's no, there, there's no consistency to them, or they can be planned as in they might be annual, so you might do social audits of uh, manufacturers in your supply chain on an annual basis or an, um, a biannual basis. Um, every company is different, in, really, in my opinion, how they manage their auditing process, or if they even do auditing. Um, I won't get into this. I could have a whole other conversation about the ways that auditing works and the ways that auditing doesn't really work. So the way that auditing is accomplishing its goal, but really a lot of the gaps, you know, in the way that auditing is not really accomplishing what we would like for it to or we want it to or need it to. And then there's um, reporting platforms like Echovatus and others that companies are using and sending out um, these you know, it's, it's kind of like a survey, it really, like, but it's a reporting platform that Echovatus has created that then, you know, a supplier has to answer um, and then report back to their customer, to their, you know, to their customer. Um, so it's, 
it's really, these are great systems that have been developed, you know, in a pretty short amount of time. I would say most of these things, most of these macro level systems have been developed over the last 10, 15 years. Um, so this is just another way to show that. So there's this consumer pressure that's pushing down on the retailers, which is pushing down on the brands, which is then pushing down on these different tiers of your supply chain. But the suppliers don't really have the capacity and they don't really even usually know where to begin. And like we get calls quite often from companies that, that are having to answer an Echo Veda questionnaire that don't even really know where to start. They don't have the systems in place and they don't really feel like it's relevant to them. And if it, 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 it is relevant to them, but they don't have a system in place and they haven't been capturing that knowledge or that information um, within their business. But it's become becoming a license to operate. It's becoming a license to be able to continue to supply. So this this nascent complex and relatively what I would call ineffective management of supply chain responsibility that I've just been describing to you, it's a great start, it really was. Like it's gotten us a long way, honestly. But it's not really reduced the enterprise risk. You know, and it's not really like, it's, the, the enterprise is not really, it's not, they're not getting any, any real, um, knowledge that their suppliers really have their sustainability act together. It's not really accomplishing the goals that we've set out, you know, as a pra practitioners in, the, in supply chain responsibility. It's not really raising the bar. It's raising the bar some, right? But it's not raising the bar um, to the height or to the way, in the way that we need it to or expect it to. Um, it's all over the map, quite frankly. And it's not helping the smaller and medium-sized business suppliers integrate sustainability. It's not helping them to really, you know, know, that most of them are just answering the surveys in any way that they can. They're just kind of scrambling to figure out what to do. But they, for the large part, are really still kind of wandering around in the dark, lost about how to really start managing sustainability more effectively. Um, so they, 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 they need... The need is to simplify, right? We really need to simplify, but at the same time that we need to simplify, we need to build the capacity. We need to build capacity within the smaller and medium-sized businesses that are, are that make up the supply chain. We need to educate them, and we need to help them learn how to integrate and manage sustainability. And I've been seeing this need, I've been seeing this need and therefore opportunity for many years now. And I, it just continues to grow, in my opinion, every year. So what we've done is we've come up with an integrated solution for that. We've spent a lot of time like literally thinking about what, what is the need and what is the solution? You know, how can we help create a solution for this, what we, you know, the problem and solve the need? And so we've come up with a three-tiered solution. Um, at the core of it, the very core of it, and what I'm going to talk about today is Tealtech. Tealtech is a SaaS-based suite of comprehensive software to help a company assess and manage and report on their performance. I'll talk more about that, you know, in a minute. And then on either side of that uh, is field experts, so seasoned, seasoned, seasoned executives, people who have had a lot of experience already managing sustainability um, that you that we can you can hire um, on a fractional basis to help bring in the expertise that you need to, and you can gain knowledge from them and they can provide the leadership that you need and then the capacity building we feel like capacity building is key you know really building the the knowledge and the education and the training that's needed to to raise the bar within the, within the companies that make up your supply chain. So this is just another way of looking at our SaaS-based platform that we're building. We, we access to thought leadership, e-learning, community building that will then lead to transformation. So enter Teal Tech. Teal Tech is an integrated SaaS platform to simplify the sustainability management for medium-sized business. 
it's, it helps companies assess, track, and manage sustain, sustainability. So they go. We have an assessment where they assess their performance, and as they're assessing their performance, it's creating a roadmap for them. And then the roadmap then directs to operational tools um, that they need for managing things like climate change, circular economy, um, their water, waste, energy footprint, all the different social dimensions and dynamics that they have to manage and are being held accountable for. Um, it's, a, it's a strategic and tactical framework. And again, these are all the different components of it that we're building out. So there's a roadmap builder. Again, it, there's benchmarking, uh, the uh, supplier code of conduct um, uh, templates that you can build from. There's all the different pieces of the puzzle. But, and the lens through which we're building all of this is simplification. So really trying to make it simple, user-friendly, and affordable, and, and easy to use, and easy to understand. Not not an easy task to accomplish, but that that is what we've been working hard to create. Um, in addition, I should mention that it it will be mapping to all the different reporting frameworks. So I had mentioned the UN Sustainable Development Goals um, frameworks that um, are relevant and um, depending on the, your, your company and depending on, you know, the, what depends on the company, which ones are material to you, whether it would be, you know, B Corp, beginning, becoming B Corp certified, whether it's the global reporting initiative to be able to report out on, on your sustainability performance, whether it's the carbon disclosure project, um, all of these different, there's many different reporting frameworks that we will be able to map to through our platform. In addition, I thought I would mention that we have a geographic risk tool. Um, this is a tool that um, looks at the sustainability risk globally um, through the lens of 202 um, countries and territories um, that can be used for, for um, getting a global picture of that risk um, on a country by country basis. These are testimonials from just a couple of companies that we've worked with at the CSR group that have used our tools um, through our engagements and have been really happy with the way our tools, um, the performance of the tools for them. Um, um, the Whole Foods, you know, they were saying that the complexity and risk of sustainability issues in the supply chain, um, <clears throat> the work has really helped to clarify that. And taking this tool to the web will allow thousands of companies to wake up to sustainability challenges of global sourcing in an easy to understand format. And that really articulates, you know, really well what we're what our goal is. And then I'll just lead you with um, this is just a little bit about the CSR group. We've been around for a long time, um, advising companies on all the different dimensions of managing sustainability. This is just a sampling of some of the companies that we've worked with over time. And then I just want um, to, to end with what I think are some key takeaways um, from, from, what we've, from what we've been, what I've been talking, what I've been sharing with you for the last 50 minutes or so. So supply chain responsibility is reaching mainstream. It, it, really, ha it really has, I've been watching it grow. I think I gave my first talk about supply chain responsibility in 2003, maybe. So that was 17 years ago. And it's really, it's, it's really come a long way since then. The uptake at this point is really growing rapidly. Again, as I said, it's really driven by, by retail and the brands, but ultimately by the consumer, you know, and as I said, you know, Gen X, Y, and Z, and all the, these younger generations that are, are growing, <laughs> every year um, are growing in purchasing power and they, they have much more heightened expectations now um, than, than, as my daughter says, the boomer generation or the, even the millennials. Um, there are different surveys, like a, number, a couple of years ago, McKinsey did a survey with the grocery manufacturers and FMI um, that showed that resource depletion and supply chain responsibility um, were, it, 
the top two issues that the, the, their industry felt they were facing that they had to figure out how to manage. In addition, we did a similar survey for the natural products industry a couple of years ago, and it showed the same results. Um, addressing climate change and circular economy are, are imperative. Um, I think, you know, it's just that's clear. I mean, and, and the supply chain footprint is a really key part of that. Industries are coming together to create efficiencies, which is which is great news, actually. Um, that there we are seeing this collaboration, and that it, and the companies are we we are there is a lot of collaboration and working together to to find the answers. Um, there's emerging regulation, as I talked about. You know, I, um, time will only tell. You know how how that plays out here in our in our in the United States, but um, there is emerging regulation throughout the world. And the opportunity for technology to simplify is here. The opportunity for technology to really play a key role um, in the management and sustainability, in my opinion, is 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 now. So with that, I'll lead you with this picture. Um, I feel feel like it paints it, it, it very well articulates. You know what I see is the long road ahead. Um, there's been a long road behind us, but a sh shorter road behind us and a much longer road ahead, in my opinion. Um, so with that, I'll open it up to questions. And I just wanted to thank you so much for inviting me and for, and for being here today and for the work that each and every one of you do. Thank you so much, Paula. That was a very insightful presentation. I really enjoyed watching it. Uh, we already have a couple of questions here in the Q&A. Just as a reminder for our attendees, feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box and Paula will be addressing them. So Paula, the first question we have is uh, related to the cone survey. Was that conduced just in the US? I work in China and I'm wondering if you know of any data on that consumer market and sustainability influencing purchase behavior. Uh, so let me repeat back the question to make sure I understand it. Um, they're asking about the cone survey and whether the cone survey was focused on the U.S. market alone and whether I know of any similar survey that's been done of the Chinese market. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, no, one, no, I don't know of a similar survey that's been done in the Chinese market, but I, if there is one, I'd love to know about it, quite, quite honestly. That's a great question. And two, the cone survey is focused on the U.S. market, yes. So that's just talking, yeah, that is just representative of the U.S. market, yes. I think if you were looking at the market globally, you know, it, certainly at Europe and other parts of the world, um, well, EMEA in general, that I think the numbers would be much higher, quite frankly. Got it. Um, Second question is, I agree that sustainability is enormously important. If it is important to consumers, I'm curious why carbon footprint, footprint labeling hasn't been utilized more to communicate this. Yeah, that's a great question. And in my opinion, it gets back to the, the piece of my presentation about the, the the plethora of standards and certifications, right? There are so many different people, players trying to capture a piece of that certification and standards market, so to speak, that there are just way, there are just way too many standards and certifications out there. And there isn't just one, what we really need is one, you know, um, pervasively used carbon labeling uh, mechanism, right? Or what, you know, and I do think there's a need for that, quite honestly. <laughs> One of the things that I had um, looked at with Whole Foods was using the QR codes or other ways of a company, you know, someone being able to scan a product and bring up the whole sustainability footprint of that product. And I probably shouldn't share that idea with you. I think it's a great, you know, I think there's a need. I think this companies out there are working on that or, and doing that. But I just, I don't, I guess because we just don't have one globally recognized carbon footprinting expectation or requirement or standard. I think that's coming, it's, um, but I, it's, we're, we're just not there yet. That's a great question now. Perfect. 
Uh, related I, I, I just want to clarify. I just want to clarify. I'm not going to. I don't. I don't mean that we're just not there yet from a market need. We are there from a market need. Like everybody needs to know their carbon footprint of every product, in my opinion, that they are purchasing. Um, I just think it's one. We don't have a, 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 a globally recognized standard, as I said, and also. The collection of that information is really complicated. You know, it's not it's not easy, and that's one thing that I I don't know that most people understand is the complexity of supply chains. And if you're looking at the carbon footprint of a product, you know, you really have to look at the carbon footprint of its whole supply of the whole supply chain. Or like, where do you where do you stop? You know, do you stop at just tier two suppliers, or do you look all the way down the chain? And if you're looking all the way down the chain, you know, for many different products, that's a that's a lot that's complex. And I think that's part of it too. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Um, related to the new EU regulation for sustainable products, what are the impacts to both B2C and B2B products? Well, I think the labeling requirement is much more, it's going to be much more impactful for B2C, right? Um, but B2B, because of the, because of B2B being a part of the supply chain, right, that, that it goes all the way up and down the supply chain. So I don't, that's a great question. You know, I got, if the top of my head, I would say it's more impactful for B2C because B2C are the ones that are going to be accountable for the labeling of their requirements. If I understand the regulation correct, correctly, it's consumer-facing products that are claiming to be sustainable are now going to have to be able to substantiate how they're making that claim. And so if the, the onus is on the B2C company, but they are going to have to be relying on um, the validity of the information that they are getting from their suppliers. Does that make sense? Yes. Oh, I think that was all the questions we have. Um, I'm going to give a couple more minutes to see if we have any questions that come in. Again, for the attendees, we have a couple more minutes for Q&A, so don't be shy. How do we learn more about teal tech? Um, you can reach out to me directly. Um, I, the, my contact information is on the screen. So either, either give me a ring or, or shoot me an email and I'm happy to talk to you about it. Perfect. I guess with that, we, I'm gonna wrap up the session. Paula, I appreciate you so much. This was a great presentation. I hope you that you all have a productive time. Uh, to all participants, thank you so much for joining us. A uh, huge shout out to Paula. This was a great presentation, really enjoying learning more about today. Um, and again, if you're interested in learning more about our programs or would like to stay in touch or subscribe our newsletter, you have my contact information. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, and yeah, let me know if you have any comments, feedbacks, or questions, and thank you very much. And I might just add, Gabriella, if anyone has any questions that come to mind after we, after the, after we leave, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm always happy to, to talk or answer any questions that you have. Perfect. Thank you very much, Paula. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you.